Hi, Clutter Fairy fans. Welcome to the Clutter Fairy Weekly for June 2nd, 2020. I'm your co-host, Ed Gumnick, and I'm talking to Gail Goddard, professional organizer and owner of the Clutter Fairy in Houston, Texas. Hi, everybody. The Clutter Fairy Weekly is our weekly uh, webcast and podcast where we talk about all things organizing, and we get those topics from you because you go and put questions into our various channels and ask us about your organizing dilemmas and we really appreciate that you do that. If you're joining us in Zoom for the first time, you can share your comments and questions via the chat and I'll try to make sure Gail answers them before we move on to another topic. You can also use the raise hand feature to let me know that you'd like to ask a question or make a comment yourself via audio or video. We're also streaming live on Facebook and I'll keep an eye on the comments there so you can share questions and suggestions and comments and I'll relay them to Gail. And during the live webcast each week, you can talk to us directly by calling 669-900-6833. Use meeting ID 993-419-863 to join the meeting. Today we're continuing our series called Organizing Room by Room and today we're spelunking into what we call alternative storage areas. Storage units, parents' houses, second homes, backyard sheds, attics, basements, and so on. We call this episode Deep Storage, <laughs> Forgotten is Not the Same as Gone. But before we get to that, I wanted <laughs> to tackle a viewer question. Okay. Um, Miranda on YouTube wrote to us to say, I wanna know more about using an ordinary room as a room for creativity. Since I am a single lady, can I use the kitchen as a part-time painting studio? So the short answer is absolutely. Your life should not be bent to fit your space. Your space should support your life. So use the rooms however you want. The only consideration in this particular scenario is whether you and the people that you share the space with can function well and easily with the setup that you use. So uh, for this instance about changing the kitchen to a studio, go for it with these particular thoughts. I had some thoughts about it. Can you isolate your work area so that any cooking doesn't deposit oil residue on your artwork or supplies? It's a fact of the kitchen that oils used in cooking sort of become airborne by the process and they sort of deposit a sheen of oil on everything near the stove over time. It's never very much at one time, but it will over a period uh, build up on its surfaces and uh, which is why you go and clean down the kitchen counters all the time. And you occasionally have to go clean the cabinets because it starts to be um, a little sticky from the residue. And so it's, it's a consideration uh, that you might wanna find a way to screen your art zone from the cooking process. The second thought I had was, do you eat in the kitchen on a breakfast table? Uh, some people, have a, sort of a breakfast nook that's near or part of the kitchen. And so if you eat in this space, um, then you want to keep that one space clear for dining so that you always have an eating zone. And then the other zone can be for the creative pursuits. You might even create a barrier with supplies or decor that splits the table so that you have stuff in the way between where you eat and where you work or um, you could put a screen or some kind of split in the room as well. Arrange the furniture so that it splits the room up so that there's a sort of designated eating zone and work zone in the kitchen in that area. I mean, <clears throat> um, the third consideration was about the supplies. The kitchen isn't likely to have a lot of storage for supplies, so you probably don't want to move everything into the kitchen. I'd set it up as a working space instead, a place where you're going to do the craft but not store all the supplies. So this helps keep the supplies fresh and clean too, because if they're not in the kitchen, then they're not gonna be gathering um, oil buildup over time. If you store them elsewhere and only pull out what you need for the project in uh, process, then that stays a work zone. And then you don't have to try to manage storing a bunch of supplies in that area as well. Um, I'm assuming that you're not talking about the island or the cooktop in the kitchen. You're talking about whatever breakfast area, sort of small dining area that's part of the kitchen. And so we're going to assume it's a small room and doesn't have a lot of storage. And so created a work, created as a work zone, but 
keep the supplies separate because you don't want to overcrowd it. And anybody that has a, we've talked about this crafting a lot here. Anybody that has a lot of craft supplies, like myself, um, you can fill up an entire room with all the craft supplies and then you don't actually have a work zone. So I think the point is for you to have the space to pursue your work and you want to treat it like a work zone and not store there. With those caveats, I say corral your kitchen and convert it to a studio and be happy as a clam. <laughs> That's my thoughts on that one. Well, and I think um, it bears repeating. This is like a clutter fairy first principle. Your life should not be bent to fit your space. Your space should support your life. 100%. I think that's a Absolutely. great That's a great takeaway. Right? Okay. Well, let's get on to our main topic, organizing room by room the the alternative storage spaces. Okay, so we're we're actually we're trying to cover um, you know, an attic or a basement, the sheds in the backyard, the storage unit in particular, when you rent a storage unit off site, that's, this is one of those deep storage places. Um, sometimes people do it in a, they designate a room in the house as the junk room, but usually, and we're talking about the garage might be considered part of that as well, although we've covered sort of garages in another topic, but this is really the space is specifically designated for storage, 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 and you're not intending to work in it or do anything in it. And so that's the areas that we're going to talk about today. And it happens a lot that when I meet somebody socially, they tell me that they need to get organized and they describe this elaborate plan to do it. And it almost always involves moving their stuff somewhere else. So the average person tries to get organized by transferring their stuff somewhere new instead of paring down to what actually fits in their living spaces. A lot of these options cost money, like the monthly fees at a storage unit or buying a new shed for the backyard or buying a second home. I've had people tell me, you know, what's the solution to my problem, Gail? Should I buy a bigger house? No, no. So it might cost, there's uh, there's also costs involved in lost revenue because the stored stuff prevents the sale of a house. If you're trying to sell your house and you have to take several months to get out, you're slowing down cashing out of your house. So that deep storage of stuff gets in the way a lot. To me, choosing to pay to keep excess stuff seems like a really expensive way to avoid making decisions. It is making a decision about what stays and what goes really so painful that you'll pay $150 or $200 in storage fees per month to avoid doing it? And talk about out of sight, out of mind, right? For the things stored in these out-of-the-way spaces, you're paying a regular fee. Uh, usually auto drafted fee, a regular fee, but it's almost always auto, dra auto drafted. And you're paying that fee to ignore the stuff. I had a client who paid me to clear out a storage unit that she had paid rent on for 12 years. And that there was stuff from her parents in there, which was part of why she was having a hard time making a decision to let it go, facing sorting the process, like she didn't want to go deal with it. So she just kept paying storage fees, but she basically paid $14,000 to not look at the stuff. Sentimental things are priceless in theory, but only if you can store them for free in your own space, not if you have to pay endless fees to keep them. If you spilled over to a deep storage location, it's time to take stock of what it's costing you to keep that excess without addressing it at all. And it's really, really expensive. It's too hard to go through the items is usually one of the reasons why it gets stored in a deep storage unit. When your parent dies and you have to clear out the house and nobody is in an emotional place to make any decisions, and then it all gets kept and moved and shoved into the attic, the basement, the garage, the, you rent a storage unit. And so it all goes in there. Dealing with the deceased loved one's belongings is heart-wrenching, and in the moment when you're forced to deal with it, you don't have the wherewithal to deal with it. And so... Um, like my client who paid for 14 years, when they died, she went and rented the storage unit and put all this stuff in there. It solved the immediate problem, but then she didn't circle back to solve the longer term problem. That makes many people stop clearing out a house or a room. It, 
if you are grieving. And so I agree that when it, you're grieving, it's a bad time to try, but you have to honor the process. And it's one of the few things that I think a storage unit helps in the beginning but it shouldn't be endless and forever avoided. And so after a year or two, it takes time, it's time to face the music and retrieve the stuff from storage and deal with it. Everybody has a different grief process. And for some people that's gonna be six months and for some people it's gonna be a couple of years. But I would say if it's been two or three years and you're still holding on to a stuff like there's still a stash of things in the storage unit that went in two or three years ago and has never come out it's time to go and look at it you can ask for help to do it so you don't have to do it alone take it slowly if you need to but don't leave it there forever as a shrine to your loss because you don't want that loved one's things to become an anchor of your grief and prevent you from moving on it is a it is a painful thing to face but two or three years down the road, it's a lot more painful in theory than it is in practice. And so from experience, I can tell you that although it will make you sad and cry to deal with the stuff, it's not impossible and you will survive and it can be done. And you can do it at whatever speed works for you. And the faster that you do it, the less money you will spend avoiding doing it. Do, avoiding doing it well and okay. wouldn't you say that um i mean a storage unit can also be it can also come in handy like if you have to if someone has to move suddenly my mm -hmm. parents um got accepted into independent living in september or so and their house sold really we really quickly like before like that even, week or something before it, even right? got list, before it even got listed and so yeah. they had to get out faster than uh than anybody planned for yeah to make all the decisions but now we're doing the work to go through the storage unit that they stuck the extra stuff in to figure out what can what can go away and be consolidated into another family you know another storage unit that several family members share yeah what it, what ultimately what stuff needs to stay for the rest of the family to inherit or right. to take possession of because it doesn't need to go into your parents new living situation right yeah yeah i mean storage units serve their purpose but they should always it should always be a temporary purpose um you're renovating the house and you have to move a whole bunch of stuff out of a room or a floor because they're going to sand the floors or they're going to paint all the walls or whatever. If you have to move out temporarily for something like that, a storage for a year while somebody works on a house makes sense. But 14 years of storage is 100% somebody not wanting to face processing the stuff. And so don't get used to storage fees. When you go into a storage unit, you should calculate. They're going to tell you, hey, it's going to be $150 a month. And you think, oh, that's cheap. And then they're like, and we'll auto debit it. And it's like, oh, that makes it easy. And they then they enable it something innocuous on your bank statement. So you don't quite remember that it's the storage unit. Like they actually come up with a name that looks sort of neutral. So you don't think about it too hard. And then, and then they just get, you know, they're hoping that they just get your money. They get an annuity from you in perpetuity. And so you don't want to be that person. When you go and rent the storage unit, you need to say, okay, I'm going to rent it for 150 bucks, which means that a year from now, it will have cost me this many thousands of dollars and keep that thought in your head and make sure that you are sure that you want to spend $6,000 in order to solve this problem and keep it for a year in there and it may be a cost of how you do the reno it may be part of what you need to do and that's that's perfectly reasonable but you should be very clear about how much money you're spending over the term over the period so you're not surprised <laughs> later when you do the calculation and you faint um kathleen in zoom shared my husband slowly closed down his business now a year later after he stopped completely he hasn't touched it 
He loved the business, but an accident prevents him from continuing. The supplies and inventory have been in storage. And that, you know, that's one of those, the life situation created a change that somebody wasn't, he wasn't ready for. And he is probably grieving the loss of his business. It is his, it is his, his experience of grieving that change in his life that he didn't anticipate or plan on. And so that means that it probably needed to marinate for him for a little while before he was willing to go and do something about it. Um, it also may feel like, you know, sometimes people put things in storage because they feel like they failed. The business closed down. I'm sure a lot of people are going through bankruptcy right now and their businesses are closing because they didn't they, you know they're in the restaurant business they're in a, a service business and they can't serve their customers and so um i think that there's going to be a lot of stuff in storage right now because of the, the covid pandemic that is going to create this situation for a bunch of people if it may be too soon to ask him. I'm not sure a, a year might not quite be enough, but you can ask whether he is ready to address it, whether he has some thoughts or plans about what he wants to do with the stuff. And truly, if he's feeling bad about it and it's it might be a relief for him to shed the stuff and not just pay to ignore it. But you have to decide and let him tell you whether a year has been enough time. Um, business is a little bit different than the death of a, f a family member, but it's still, if it was a big part of his life and he enjoyed it and loved it, it would be a hard thing to let go of all the inventory and supplies, but he can't return to it. So it, it might be time to start thinking about, do we want to find another person to take this stuff over and pass this on to so that someone else can make use of this stuff? Yeah, especially if you can, instead of paying for storage, you can turn it into a little bit of income to, uh, you know, for somebody to take it off your hands. Yeah. And, and, and then get out of the storage shed and sort of let go of the, you know, the anchor that makes you feel bad. <laughs> Sometimes it just makes people feel bad to look at the stuff. I mean, if you imagine a situation where uh, somebody gets divorced and it's a big, you know, horrible angry awful sad time and people split up houses and they somebody has to go and rent a storage unit to get their stuff out of the house and go throw it in in some place and then it becomes this place where you associate with the bad situation and so then you don't want to face it because it reminds you about the divorce or the fighting or whatever and you don't want to go in there and cry or be angry or whatever and mess with the stuff and so i get it and this is one of the ways that storage unit makes money. They count on you emotionally not wanting to deal with the stuff. And they're hoping that you will fund them in perpetuity by ignoring your own things. <laughs> I'm telling you, don't help them make money that way. <laughs> Go and clear out your storage space if yeah. it's been long enough. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. <laughs> um, okay, so then. One more thing. Go ahead. Tanya mm -hmm. on Facebook said. I'm the executor of my mom's estate and need to go through the house and divide the items. Mom's been gone three years and family members are digging in their heels saying they're still grieving and can't help with the process. I recently lost my husband and I have to empty my house and sell it and need to move into my mom's house soon. Any suggestions to get family members on board to get this done? I'm the executor, but they see me as the baby sister. How can I make them understand that I, meaning we, need to finalize the estate. Appreciate any advice. So this is one of the things that happens when, um, the, you know, the person that's let, that's assigned the executor becomes the person that is made in charge of making stuff happen. And the other people are like, I'm not the executor, so I can't do anything. And they use it as an excuse to not have to do the work. I mean, if you imagine that somebody else's home, if you're having trouble with your own clutter, imagine having to go deal with somebody else's clutter. I'm sure everybody is overwhelmed with the thought process of dealing with your mom's house and that it's so much work and what are we going to do? And no one wants to face it or deal with it. Um, 
which doesn't leave you in a very good position. It means that nobody wants to put that chore at the top of their list. So I would think that the way to get started is for you to go and start doing some work. And you have the perfect excuse now because you need to move into your mother's house and sell your house. And so you can start making movement to do things. And even if they won't help you, they can't complain. <laughs> so um, part of how you can make it easier for them is that you can go through and sort the stuff and get rid of trash, throw away obvious things, shred paperwork. There's all kinds of things that you can do that are related to dealing with your mom's estate that isn't the, you know, the kitchenware and the furniture, right? There's all, uh, there's all other kinds of things in the house. And so I would go and you want to clear all those out before you move in probably. So I would go and start working on that stuff and tell your siblings that you're doing that. And um, even if they don't come and help, if you're notifying them that you're working, then they can't complain later when they're like, where is that thing? No, no, too late. So start with the stuff that's easy, clear out the paperwork, go for the trash. You know, there's old food in there and there's old, you know, stuff in the pantry. And there's things that you can clear out that no one can really object about. And then when you get to a place where you absolutely want them to come and like pick things that they want or whatever, then I would sort and stage for that. So pull out all the things that you think people are going to want to ask about and line them up like it's a estate sale in the house, like dismantle the house in some way. Don't leave it exactly how your mom had it and pile the stuff up in bundles and let well, people come and look at the bundles and L Lorraine suggested um taking photos of things you think people might want and distributing those especially if you're spread out um I think that's a great suggestion yeah to remind them that there are these are these are things that there are things here that you probably have some attachment to and yeah. it's time and to start talking it's time to speak up about those and you need to come and look yeah. and there will be lots of sentimental paper. So as you find photographs and here's, you know, schoolwork from your siblings and that kind of stuff, there's that kind of paperwork and photos sent directly sentimental stuff that you can just box and ship to your relatives. Like here, this is here, Katie, here's your school paperwork. I'm shipping it to you. I'm not sorting it. I'm sending it to you to sort and just ship it away. And those expenses can be part of the estate. Um, if they're not willing to come to you locally or travel from away to help, then you are certainly within your rights to do what you need to do and clear out the house. And so <laughs> um, we can talk about this at more uh, at greater length if you need some more suggestions but I think um, getting started for yourself because you have a need to get into the house is a perfectly reasonable explanation for why you've started the process and it and you tell them that you're going to do that and you start with stuff that they don't care about and tell them you're going to send them things that are specifically theirs that you find. And then when they have to start making choices, you can start sending photos. And if they won't participate then, then you just have to start um, letting stuff go. There, that's <laughs> that's the commentary I have on that. Okay, I should let you get back to your notes. Okay, so the, the shed, I hear people say, but it's right outside in the shed. So it's not in a storage unit, but their alternative version is right outside in the shed. Okay, it's true, but unless you spend a fortune on the shed, it's probably not very airtight. It's really hot in the summer sun and the bugs can get in there. So that's not really honoring your things. It's just sort of parking things back there. So those sheds don't really come cheap and the nicer, better built ones cost you a bunch of money. So it's, it's an expensive solution. And you may want to spend the money instead on an organizer to get the stuff handled instead. Um, stuff in the shed sits there deteriorating until you have to give up a weekend to drag the contents to heavy trash. So 
um, you're pulling them out to the curb for heavy trash pickup and you're doing it while you're sweating and hot. And so you do get to defer decisions by having a shed, but then you have to waste a Saturday someday to empty the shed. So why not do it now before you've spent the money on the shed? Um, there, there are people use sheds for gardening tools and equipment, which makes perfect sense if you actually go in and out of the shed to get the gardening stuff in and out, but going and putting luggage, um, you know, clean clothes, furniture, things like that. It, what happens is it goes out there and it just gets really dry and really dusty over time. And so if it's going to be in the shed for a short period of time or a season, like it goes in the summer stuff that you use on the patio, for instance, and it goes in in the winter so that it stays uh, fresh and it, I mean, it doesn't get um, deteriorated from 365 days of exposure uh, and you pull it out for the summer months and then you put it back in for the winter. Okay. That means that it's coming out, it's getting washed and dusted, it's getting used and then it's getting put back again. That's okay, but most people buy a shed and they put stuff in there and then it never comes out again. And so it's no different than parking it in the garage or parking in the attic. And then you forget what's in there and then it gets deteriorated from the heat and the bugs. And then you got to throw it out. So <laughs> that's a lot of um, work for something that you ultimately end up having to throw away because it's been ruined. So I would um, be very particular about how you use sheds make sure that it's not just because you want to park something and forget about it. Make sure it's a place that you want to put something that you're going to randomly take in and out that you're going to use pretty frequently and that it's not so stuffed you can't get into it. Okay. And then somebody will say to me, that's what the attic or the basement is for, right? <laughs> it's not really right. Uh, these areas are not usually climate controlled and are more likely to speed up the deterioration of the contents. Um, I know that's not true in other parts of the country. In Houston, the attic is scorching hot in um, about half the year. It's yeah, the attic what, is a death sentence for most things. <laughs> right. It will accelerate the death of anything a thousand times. Right. And so um, in other parts of the country, where the temperature's more mild, it, it's cold in the winter, you know, then it things get frozen in theory. They get really, really cold, but I'm not sure that that affects the deterioration very much. But, you know, it's still humid in some places and there's bugs always. And yeah, it's not the best place to store things in perpetuity. So, um, and nobody wants to go up there anyway, much less when it's jam full of stuff. It is a free option, of course, but as an organizer, a stuffed attic or a basement is a sign to me of a lot of deferred decisions. And th these are the f these rooms are always the final stops before someone goes on to rent a storage unit <laughs> or goes on to pull the stuff out to the curb for heavy trash. So um, the last attic that I cleared out had been the way that the wife hid stuff from her husband. So she didn't want to get rid of anything. And so she would save it by stuffing it into the attic. So their attic wasn't above the house. It was at the edge of the house. So she was able to walk from a hall straight into a room that was unfinished like this one behind me. Um, and she would, she could stack all kinds of stuff in there. And she slowly over time filled out this sort of, it was kind of an E shape. It's like this, you know, slanted roof. And so it was sort of a big triangle, right? She slowly filled out this room that ran the entire length of the house and she completely filled it up. So she was deceased and my client got it in his head that if there was a problem with the pipes up there in the attic, that nobody would be able to get in to repair it. And so he decided it was time to clear it out. So I spent several appointments clearing it out hauling it down a flight of stairs and hauling it off. And he and his kids wanted nothing that was in there. And I trashed and donated everything, including the things that had wasp nests on it because it was attic storage. So because it was next to the eaves of the house, there were some open gaps. And so they had a like a whole colony of wasps all up and down in here where they, the ones that like attach little dirt houses and they go in and out of a little dirt house you know, in the attic, in the heat for them, it's like, hey, this is a cool, dark place. I'm going to come in here. Cool. It's a hot, dark place. 
and it's out of the weather. And so I can come in here and build my nest. <laughs> so I kept having to pull things out, boxes, containers, knock wasp nests off, which was luckily nobody flew at me. You know, they were not, they were from previous years. They had been, they were not occupied. <laughs> no, they were growing them. They had been growing them for a long time. And so I knocked a lot of wasp nests off of stuff before I took things off away. It was a huge project and it cost him a lot of money. And it really was his wife's deferred decisions for her entire married life. And it was a big mess to clean up. And I, he spent a lot of money for me to do it. And he couldn't, you know, he was, he was older than me. He had a um, injury. He couldn't really go up and down the stairs very much. And so I dragged things down this narrow rickety little stair that I couldn't even like walk forward. I couldn't walk down the stairs with a box in my hand. It, it wasn't wide enough. And so I had to sort of drag boxes down the stairs behind me to get everything out of that attic. And it was some hard, hard work that I did not enjoy. So, you know, don't create yourself a project like that. Don't fill up the attic. <laughs> I've also done some virtual organizing with a client in a basement and she couldn't really walk through the room one of the things that they were storing in there was um, uh, supplies that they used for a, some kind of side gig during the summer. It was a way that they made money, extra money during the summer months, and they would keep those supplies in there. But they were mixed up with all the other stuff that was in the basement. And if you park things in storage without a plan, um, with assigned zones, and just throw things in as you find them, you'll never remember what all is down there, and you never know what to look for when um when you even if you do remember you don't know where to go look is what i mean so there's nothing helpful about wading through an archaeological dig to find something important things get buried and then they get rebought instead of searching for it like if you go down and look at the basement or the attic or the storage unit and it just looks like a big old wad of stuff because that's how you threw it in there to begin with and you stand there and look at it, and it's like, oh, God, I can't face that. That's too much of a chore. That's too ha much of a hassle. And whatever you're looking for, you're going to go rebuy anyway. So why even fill the shed to begin with? Why fill the attic or the basement with stuff that you are then going to ignore? Excuse me, because it's too much of a hassle, and you're going to go rebuy what you can't find. So don't create this storage pile to begin with. Just acknowledge that it's not something that you're likely to come back and get again. And even if you have to, you don't want to do the work to make it happen. And uh, let it go, let it go, let it go. And then when you want something again, five years from now, you can go buy it again. That's my theory. <clears throat> and those are my comments about um, deep storage spaces. So does anybody have any questions about it that they would like to ask? Charlotte, who's with us in Zoom, said she's she has a shed and um, I have a shed next to the house that we built 25 years ago. Mm. It needed much repair over the years. Recently I had to have someone remove a beehive. Then I had to have a carpenter repair that and the, and the door, it needs new doors for 850. There is only junk in the shed. What should I do with this shed? Now I asked some follow-up questions and she said that having it, demolished it, it looks as if having it demolished would cost more than the repairs it needs what are your thoughts on that so the first thing i'd ask is if there's just junk stored in there then i say this is a money pit that is never going to stop needing repair and it's always going to be a problem and it will not enhance the resale of your house whether you intend to sell it yourself or whether someone has to come behind you and sell it. So I would say, A, spend the time to um, pull everything out and dispose of it. And then I would, if you can do it in the United States, I would rent a bagster and get out the sledgehammer and knock that stuff down and throw it in the waste management bagster. Or you can time it for, um, another heavy trash day and destroy the thing and pull it out. If you're just using it to store junk anyway, and you've lived in the house for a long time, it's likely stuff that you even, it's like in terrible shape. You've forgotten it's there. If you've had to do that many repairs, that much 
bug mitigation, <laughs> if you, you know that stuff in there is not ever going to be useful to you. And so even if you pull out two things a week for heavy trash, I mean, for regular trash and go throw one thing in your trash bin at a time, or you come out one weekend when heavy trash is coming and you pull everything out to the curb and let people pick it and let all that stuff be hauled off and then just destroy the shed. Because if you're already having to do a bunch of repairs and you're not holding anything that's of value to make it worth keeping the shed in good repair, continuing to spend money to keep it up, then I think it's time to let it go. I mean, I can't imagine that fixing the, you know, it's not going to be the first or last time that you have insects of some kind in there causing a problem. It's going to continue to get wet and get rained on. It's going to continue to be aging in place. Clearly, if the shed has been there that long, it's just going to sit there and age in place. And so there is no good reason to throw good money after bad at this point if you're not actually storing something that needs to be outside that you need to keep forever and so i would say empty it destroy it well and i would also sort of um dig a little deeper into that question she said it would cost a lot to demolish maybe more than the cost of the repair but i think you it's time for an honest assessment of do I have an alternative purpose for which this shed is a great solution? You know, if I got the junk out, is there something I would put in there that would be a good use of the shed? If, if that's a strong yes, well then do what you need to make it usable, repair it, put in shelving, etc. But if it's not, if it's a, if it's not a strong yes, if you don't have another alternative purpose, then I would take it a step further and make a couple phone calls, get someone else come to come and assess demolishing it. And well, and comparing the cost of demolishing it to the cost of one repair is, is apples to oranges because it's not going to be the only repair you have to do to it. You're going to do this repair now, but you will have continue to have future repairs it's an it's 25 year old shed it's not going to stop falling apart it's going to continue to deteriorate in place and so this is not going to be the last repair money you spend so either you have one finite cost to tear it down or you have repair bills in perpetuity and those are your choices and and in order to keep that shed and pay repair bills in perpetuity, there needs to be a really good reason. And if it's actually full of junk and you don't need it to store something very specific and valuable that requires being in a shed in your house, I I don't see how that's going to be a good return for your money in any way. It's spending money to keep a building that is not serving your family anymore. Yeah. Um, an anonymous user in Zoom has asked, what about sentimental, sentimental furniture you might use one day? So there furniture things to unpack there. <laughs> yes, right. Yeah. Furniture is big and um, lots of people save furniture because they inherited it. They remember it. They used it for a long time in an an earlier part of their life and now it's been replaced with something else and this is exactly what my client that had the storage unit for 14 years did um she it was furniture out of her parents house that she couldn't bear to part with and she thought it was antiques and so that it was worth a lot of money and of course it wasn't worth a lot of money in her mind, it was valuable because they were, it was her family's furniture and it was her memories about the furniture, but it wasn't actually a real value of the furniture. And so she paid me to empty the storage unit, to sell all the things on, um, you know, I did, I did, uh, I did some online um, communicating to generate sales and had people come and pay me money and take pieces away. So I sold the pieces, but the money that she made on the furniture, she paid me to make the sale happen and to make the storage unit get empty. 
So it was a net zero for her gain. She didn't get anything out of it. And she paid 14 years of storage on it. So I get it that furniture is sentimental, just like, you know, the photograph or the, the glasses that your mother wore, but furniture is a much harder thing to store without making decisions about because it takes up a whole lot of room. So you might use it someday and you have to evaluate your future plans. Are you going to age in place in the house that you're in? Are you intending to renovate your house and change the decor to incorporate these pieces of furniture? Is it, do you intend for these pieces of furniture to be uh, gifted to family members who have said to you that they actually want them? I mean, it's hard to be sentimental about furniture and give up valuable storage space in order to keep them. And the truth is the furniture could be useful to someone else now and not be a burden for you to keep. And of all the pieces that you keep, there's probably a few that are super, super special to you. And then there's another 75% that aren't super special. So I would at least filter any furniture that you feel sentimental about, filter it for um, how, how special and important it feels to you, and then try to get rid of stuff at the bottom of the list. If you have one or two pieces and you can figure out a way to store it, even so I would, if you have an open-ended, maybe I'll use this someday with no actual plan or schedule, then putting those in a storage unit and paying storage will mean that you will have spent $14,000 to keep that break front piece that was your mother's and you ended up reselling it for $200. Like you don't want to pay for the privilege to keep the option open. So putting it in storage is probably not the best solution unless there's a plan like I'm renovating my house right now and six months from now, this piece of furniture is going to come back out and the decorator is going to put it into this room. Right. If or somebody a, is going to, someone's going to graduate from college and, and get their apartment. If you have a real timeline and, and an hour and, and a plan, and a hard target. <laughs> Yeah, that's one thing. But if you're just saying, I remember this furniture, I feel fond of this furniture, I have no plan for this furniture, I have no space for this furniture, no one wants this furniture in my family, so I'm going to keep it and I'm keeping the possibility, I would say you need to work a little bit harder about um, letting that one go. It may be hard and you may want to take a picture of the piece of furniture and you may want to, you know, confirm that no one else in the family wants a piece of furniture, but storing a big, large something that takes up a big hunk of square feet in your house or in a attic or a basement where it's just going to sit out there and die, dry out. I mean, wood f furniture is always, it's wood and it's, and drying out constantly it's got fabric that's getting dusty and having things invade you know it it is not going to stay out in your alternative storage unit alternative storage area pristine and clean and in perfect condition it's going to sit out there and deteriorate much faster unless it's actually in your home and you're dusting it and cleaning it all the time like people do when the stuff is in the house and so time to let it go. <laughs> well, it's, yeah. Uh, it's time to really think hard about why you're keeping it and whether there's actually a plan. And cause it takes up a lot of space. Otherwise. I may mentioned in our, in our family, we have sort of a culture of sharing stuff around. And so when something isn't working in your present space like after our move and after mom and dad's move into independent living we shuffled a lot of things from family from household to household and said you know what 
we need we need one of these. Do you have one of these you're not using? And we're not going to use this table. So do you all have a use for it? And I had, well, you remember when, when Todd got his, our, when our good friend got his vacation home in Galveston, yes. his, week, his weekend place, everyone who hoped to spend weekends there found things to donate, things they weren't using to, to furnish that house. And I love the idea that the library table that was my desk as a kid is now in that space serving a useful purpose for someone I love, you know, right. and I think some, I can't remember who it was. Somebody told us a story, somebody here in the, in, in the meeting, I think some time ago told us a story about giving something away, putting some, you know, doing, I think, I don't know if they put it on a free cycle or a local New, newsletter or something and gave it away to someone you know a young family who got good use from it yes think, you really really needed it you know I think keeping things for sentimental reasons is 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 fine as long as you're not giving up space giving up money giving up stress you know suffering stress to maintain that stuff that you're keeping and what isn't it great if there's someone else who can use it and you can turn that over to someone who's going to get good use out of it every day exactly and i think if you have memory sentimental memories it's usually you're remembering it from your own childhood it's part of the landscape of your growing up and becoming an adult most of the time. And so um, you remember visiting it at your grandmother's house. You rem This was the kitchen table that everybody used around the house. And so either you want to incorporate it into your current life, or you should consider that someone else might want to make those family memories with it and let it become their kitchen table or become their uh, break front where they keep all the china. And it can have a better and more useful life if it moves on to become somebody else's centerpiece um, uh, problem solver you know focal piece in their house let it go and you got your 25 years out of it or you got your 40 years out of it or whatever and you have all your memories to go with it and if it doesn't work for you now you know, you can say, okay, I, I thank you, and I'm going to send you on to the next family that's going to get 40 years out of it. And what a better way to extend its life and have it be well cared for than to put it in an attic somewhere and let it slowly die of heat exposure and bugs and dust. And that's the furniture is a burden when it's not useful, and it, because it's so large and they take up, it's such a big square footage eater. And so um, coming up with a solution that doesn't involve manufacturing a parking space in your life is it's better to let that to come up with a solution that lets it get used in your decor, in your family's decor, like in Ed's situation or in some other family that you don't know. We did the same thing with a couch. I inherited a couch from a friend. Um, uh, because she upgraded and we needed one in the room when we moved into this house we had a, a, a den that we needed a couch in and we used it and then we decided that we wanted to go and buy a different one we were ready to buy one and so that couch went on to another family and I was happy to let it go and live with somebody that it was uh, young adults they had small children and it was like here you can have a no cost couch at a time in your life when it's it's a burden to buy furniture and here's i got a free one and here it is and it it was a perfect way to i could get what i wanted in something new and i could let them have the use of the couch and it didn't go to the curb and so making the effort to list those things on next door for instance if you go on next door and list them Hey, I have this couch. Here it is. <laughs> you know, somebody that needs it will come and take it, and and you can count on that. It's not worth the effort to come and get it if you don't need it. And so, <clears throat> you can make your furniture have a new life, 
even if you, it doesn't have a life for you anymore other than in your memory. And, you know, take a bunch of pictures of it and send it on. <laughs> That's my thought about that. Well, we've had um, all kinds of great comments in the chat and more than we're possibly going to be able to get to today. But just one last one I wanted to share from okay. Jane. Jane in Zoom said, Hi, Jane. Going back to Tanya's question about uh, th uh, three years without an estate being settled. We've had a family member pass last year, and I'm encouraging family to move forward with settling the estate. Mm -hmm. In this case, they don't have the money to keep up the parent's house. Mm -hmm. Realizing everyone is different, is there an amount of time you generally recommend or commonly commonly see for this process? So for the process of settling the estate um, or facing your grief, I think um, usually within one or two years, and I would say at, t at the two-year mark, most people, although they're still sad, they have sort of emotionally absorbed the new situation, and they are at least in a good enough place to face and deal with the things. Um, you know, one year might be, because you have to go past all those one first holidays. Here's the first birthday of the person that died. Here's the first Mother's Day. Here's the first Christmas. Here's the first, you know, your birthday without your parent. And so you have to get past all those first year triggers, which is all part of the new reality, right? Of here's what's life life will be like now without this person present. And so I think that it's hard to do it until all the first anniversaries have gone by. It's harder. It's not impossible, but it's harder. Once the first anniversaries have gone by and you're, you know, going through this into the second year, um, it, it's a little bit more integrated, I would say, in your psyche and a little bit easier for you to face this chore. And some people, they need to deal with it right away, right? If there's a, uh, if there's a financial constraint, which is, you know, the parents die and nobody can keep up the mortgage, right? Like it's an immediate. Yeah, you must sell that house. You have to get it out, right? And so then sometimes people are faced with the chore of dealing with the stuff despite their horrible grief. And, and this is when I think, you know, you do some basic work, you throw out trash, you throw out obvious stuff, and you move the rest of stuff to storage and let it marinate for a year. And the family just agrees that we're going to pay storage fees for a year or a year and a half, and then everybody's going to go back. And as a team, we're going to empty the storage unit as if it was the parent's house. And, and that's the thing. You, you have to you have to transfer the problem. You have to cope with the problem imminently uh, sometimes. But then when you've gotten a little bit past your grief, you have to go and finish the process. And some people never do that part. And it costs them a huge amount emotionally. And it costs them a huge amount in money. And it, it's, it's, a, it's a hard thing to leave until forever. <laughs> right? It is. Um, but you will emotionally probably be a in a little bit better position after all the first anniversaries have gone by and, you know, a little bit into that, you know, into that second year. And, you know, yeah, you're going to cry. It's going to be sad. You're not going to enjoy those days at all. But you can also plan it. So nobody says you have to do it all in one sitting. You can also plan it that you go over and you agree that you're going to go over for, uh, you know, two hours and spend two hours working on something. And, you know, every two hours that you put into it is two more hours down the road. And it's that much more stuff out the trash. And, you know, hopefully uh, you end up with, you end up at the end done. And, you know, if you, if there, if the money is there, this is a perfect thing to let an organizer come and do because, they can do all the physical work and they can do pre-sorting and they can make piles and say, this pile is all things that we think is trash. Is it okay to throw it out? And then person can look around at it and go, yes, no, I need that. You know, this is a pile that I think is photos that you probably want to take. Okay. I'll take those. Like 
you can get some support from someone who is not emotional and let them come and do some of the hard slogging, you know, the actual movement, the physical stuff, you know, it's, it's clearing out an estate is, is like moving. It's the same process as moving. You have to empty the house to the bare walls most of the time. And so, um, getting some help with that physical work means that you can spend your energy facing the emotional challenge and let somebody else spend their energy doing the physical work. If you don't have that money, then, you know, you need to get your family members to help you do that. And a professional organizer or family friend might also be able to bring the needed objectivity to say, no, you're not going to get $5,000 for this, this thing it's really only valuable to a family member. So one of you, one of you take it. <laughs> Somebody needs to take it or we need to, we need to donate it away. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. We are yeah. out of time. We're, we're way oh. out of time. Okay. Um, I want to take a moment to thank um, our newest Patreon subscriber, Petra. Patreon Thanks, Petra. Patron, I guess we say not subscriber. And <laughs> To repeat our commercial from last week to say, if you would like to support our projects with a little little money, we wouldn't mind. Go to cfhou.com slash Patreon. We will meet same time next week, Tuesday, June 9th at noon U.S. Central Time. And we'll talk about organizing room by room the guest room. The guest room. Guest rooms are often a multi-purpose space that's part hotel, part craft room, part office, part junk room, and all chaos. Exactly. And there's, there's some very specific, you know, collection and discussion about zoning that goes with get with guest room. So we're going to cover that next week. I'm going to cut short our usual ending announcements and just say, join us live by joining the meetup group, cfhou.com slash meetup. You can also follow us on Facebook by going to cfhou.com slash Facebook or get on our mailing list by going to cfhou.com slash subscribe. Ta-da. We love to hear from you. So keep the comments, questions and comments and topic suggestions coming in YouTube. And you can always reach us through our website at clutterfairhouston.com. There you go. We are so happy that you joined us this week and we will be thrilled to death to see you next time. We hope everybody stays healthy and well, and we will see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye.